Hey guys, D Mensch Master Studios here. How y'all doing? Sorry that it's been a while since I posted a video on my channel, guys. I have just been busy lately with part of that being something special that I'm working on when it comes to the channel, and I hope you guys are looking forward to that. But hey, I am finally back with a brand new video on the day that's also the five-year anniversary of Super Mario Odyssey. So hey, you know, that's nice, the anniversary of my favorite game of all time. That's cool. But anyway, let's get into what I want to talk about. With Chris Lines having a lot of villains being brought back when it comes to the season, it's made me realize how many villains there really are when it comes to the show. There are so many of them. And a lot of villains, I feel, are honestly pretty underrated compared to other villains. There are some really good and amazing villains that the fan base, I feel, doesn't appreciate as much as they should. And so in today's video, I am sharing with you guys my list of the five most underrated Ninjago villains. Now, this is obviously just my own opinion. Yours can be different, and that is totally fine. Feel free to leave your personal opinions down below, and let's do this. Also, another thing, just like when I made my list of the top five most overrated and most underrated Ninjago seasons, this isn't going to be in any specific order. These are just five villains in general. So, let's begin. The first villain that we have is Samukai. When it comes to Samukai, I think it's pretty interesting. He is the first ever villain we have gotten when it comes to the show. He showed up all the way back during the pilot season, and there was a lot of really interesting things about him. For starters, he was the first ever general who we saw when it came to an Ninjago villain, and we would see a lot more after that. He was also the first ever four-armed Ninjago character of all time, which is really, really cool, I think. Plus, it led to more four-armed villains that we would end up getting in the future, like Garmadon and Nanakon, for example. That's very interesting. Plus, I really like his and Garmadon's dynamic for how Samukai was the original ruler of the Underworld until Garmadon showed up and took over the Underworld. And Samukai has secretly been plotting revenge this whole time. That, I think, is something pretty interesting. I also think it's really cool that when it comes to Samukai, again... He showed up all the way back during the pilot season, and he was even brought back for Day of the Departed. That is really, really cool. They remembered him, and again, he was brought back for that special. That was definitely really nice. I just wish we got a chance to see him more when he came to the show, since he only ever showed up during the pilot season, a brief flashback during season two, and Day of the Departed. But again, for what we got, I think that was definitely great. Up next, we have Asphira. When it comes to Asphira, I think it's definitely pretty interesting when it comes to her. She was the first ever wild ray antagonist we ever got, and overall, I think she isn't as bad as fans tend to make her out to be sometimes. For starters, when it comes to Asphira, I really like her history that she has with Sensei Wu and how he taught her Spinjitsu, which she ultimately used to try and overthrow King Mambo in order to try and take over all Ninjago. That I think is really interesting. Also, when it comes to the Spinjitsu aspect, Asphira is the first major villain in Ninjago who knows Spinjitsu, who actively uses it against the ninja. Like, the marketing stuff that they had when it came to the pilot season in Season 1 had a whole bunch of spinner battles and stuff going on when it came to the sets with and the characters using Spinjitsu against each other. Now we finally get a chance to see that in the show. That is really cool. Plus, I also like what they did with Asphira during Crystallize by turning her into a more comedic villain with her being obsessed with revenge. That, I think, was honestly a pretty great decision. Plus, I also like the fact that she also has some stuff to do with Nia's story of her losing her powers. That, I think, was also a pretty interesting decision for them to make when it came to this season. And overall, out of all the members of the Council of the Crystal King, I do think that when it comes to Asphira, they actually did a pretty good job when it came to her. Speaking of Council members, up next we have The Mechanic. When it comes to the mechanic, it's really interesting to see the journey that he's gone on when it comes to the show. He was initially introduced during Season 6 as basically just a throwaway joke character, essentially, and really all we knew about him is just he's a cyborg and he worked for Chen. That was literally it. But things for him changed over time, with him appearing again during the Season 8 premiere, battling against Kai and Zane, then appearing once again during Season 11 in the episode The Absolute Worst, before finally having a major role during Prime Empire, with him helping out Unagami with trying to help Unagami get into the real world. That, I think, is something really cool to see. And it shows that when it comes to the mechanic, okay, there's a lot of interesting stuff that can happen to this guy. Mainly for how he was able to go from being this low-life thug to one of Ninjago's greatest threats, actually. I mean, he was even brought to be a member of the Council of the Crystal King, and is considered to be a much, much bigger deal. That, I think, is a really cool thing for them to do, actually, and it shows that anyone has the capacity to do great things. That, I think, is something really interesting. The only real issue that I have with the mechanic is what they do with him during Part 2 of Crystallized, where he fixates on this idea of Nia not being able to do anything without her powers, and the show doesn't do anything to prove him wrong, because for a lot of stuff in Crystallized, it basically shows Nia as being basically powerless and not being able to do anything without her powers, and again... 
never really proves the mechanic wrong about this at all. Like, it's not even Nia who defeats the mechanic. It's Okino who ends up doing that. I think that was a bit of a weird move, but by and large, I do still really like the mechanic, and I think he's definitely a great and overall hilarious villain. Up next, we have Iron Baron. When it comes to Iron Baron, I think that things are definitely, once again, interesting when it comes to this guy. Mainly because of how Iron Baron ends up connecting into the main themes of Season 9. When it comes to Season 9, its main theme that it has is the idea of power and how it can take many different forms. This is mainly shown when it comes to Garmanon with his power coming from his actual power and his strength, and Lloyd with his power being his words and what he can say. And what's interesting is that Iron Baron represents this exact same idea, but on the opposite end. Iron Baron represents the illusion of power and something that could be there, but isn't actually there, with it being his lies. He constantly lies to and manipulates the hunters so that way he can get whatever he wants, just so that way he can have full control over the first realm. That I think is something that is very, very interesting, honestly. Plus, when it comes to Iron Baron, I think it's really nice that the way he's ultimately defeated is what he's been doing the whole time. It's with lies. Since Wu lies about the truth of the dragon armor, and that's what ultimately causes Iron Baron to be defeated by Firstborn. I think that is a really, really cool detail overall. While I don't think that the Iron Baron is a particularly great villain, what they end up doing with him with this idea of the illusion of power that he has, I think that's something very, very interesting and not seen often when it comes to Ninjago villains. It's definitely really cool. Finally, the last villain who I want to talk about easily has to be General Vex. If you've seen some of my Ice Chapter videos, then you knew exactly that this was coming. I love Vex. I think that Vex is an absolutely amazing villain and character when it comes to the show, and I think that he is easily the best Wild Ray antagonist we have gotten, and easily the best post-movie villain, and I honestly think that he has been the best villain in the show since Nauticon, honestly. Because just, Vex is absolutely amazing. I won't go into too much detail because I already made an entire video talking about Vex and how great of a character he is, and so if you want more information, please go check out that video. But for the short version, I really like Vex's backstory and how he ends up connecting to the heroes, mainly the ninja and Akita. I really like how when it comes to Vex, he's meant to be this parallel to Lloyd and Akita and representing the dark and negative aspects when it comes to trust and everything. And how this is what they can end up turning into if they give in to their paranoia and fear, especially Lloyd. That's really interesting. I also like how Vex as general is in total control of everything until Lloyd shows up and he realizes that Lloyd could potentially undo everything that he has done so far. That I think is a really cool detail. And honestly, I really like Vex's punishment for how he's banished by the end of the season because it's a coming full circle thing when it comes to the story. Because he initially started on in self-exile because he believed everyone hated him. And by the end of the season, he's being exiled because now everyone does actually hate him. That I think is something really cool. And so that's pretty much all I got for you guys. So tell me down below what do you guys think. What are your guys' thoughts on some underrated Ninjago villains? Tell me down below and I hope you guys enjoy. Later guys, this is Mention Master Studios, signing off.